Hello, welcome friends. Uh, it's a little embarrassing, I don't often make these kinds of uh, live stream videos for my channel. Um, but I thought, voila, this is my face, you can see what I look like. And um, I'm going to try and come at you with a, uh, a greater variety of formats uh, rather than the uh, style that I'm usually known for making, which is these long form kind of uh, videos that take me just way too long to make. And I miss you guys, and I just kind of wanted to touch base and talk about some uh, some issues relating to China and uh, just, yeah, just anything related to China, just whatever comes to mind, we're going to talk about. And uh, yeah, so, you know, the thing is with my videos, it just takes me so long to make. Uh, I have to research for ages, I have to uncover and pioneer things that very few people have discussed before. And um, as a result, I don't really get the opportunity to churn out content the way that YouTube wants me to. But... At the same time, you know, I actually like putting out more content as well. Um, not just for the algorithm, but I, I just think it's, you know, I, I like being more regular. It's just, it's hard to do it with the, with the format that I do. So here I am, I'm just going to just, just uh, go off the dome. Um, so yeah, shout out to my friend Laz. He just came back from China. He's back in Australia right now because a lot of chaos going in China right now. I'm sure a lot of you guys are aware of what's going on with the COVID situation. Um, Qingling, as they call it. Zero COVID. Very, very draconian measures. I hope the rooster doesn't, doesn't bother you. I'm out in the middle of nowhere right now. Won't say where. Um, but yeah, it's getting really uh, crazy in China. And he wanted to leave because, well, if you stick around to find out what the response of the Chinese government is going to be to, uh, to a very large amount of unrest, it's it's probably a very bad chess move if you want to stick around and find out um, as, as you know if there's going to be some unrest in the country uh, they don't they're not very tolerant of this kind of stuff um, I hear there's there's rumors of like tens of thousands of SWAT team people going around to people's houses and um, and just just taking them away if, if they were seen uh, protesting and it's it's very easy to to see who was and wasn't protesting, um, you know, and also a lot of people, a lot of the protests is kind of online. Um, I know people have kind of come up with the smart way of protesting. They'll just have like a, a blank piece of paper and it's just kind of implied that people understand exactly what they're protesting against. But um, the government's also smart as well. Um, and pretty much anyone that's doing these kinds of subversive activities um, will very quickly be whisked away. So I am very concerned about the Chinese people right now. Um, and I'm, I'm worried about my friends in China. And But fortunately for my international friends, it's just it's easy. They can, they can just go away before things get bad. But yeah, it looks like we are staring down the precipice of something very major. We haven't seen something like this since Tiananmen. Um, and yeah, I, I, think, I think, look... Comparing this to, to Tiananmen is, is a good place to start. Let, let's let's go with that. So many people are comparing this to Tiananmen, and I would like to chime in and say it's say how it's a little bit different this time. Um, so the difference between this time and Tiananmen is that um, the protesters in Tiananmen weren't necessarily uh, very physical or getting very kinetic with the police. Um, for the most part, they were yelling slogans. Um, yes, they were sh shouting democratic slogans and things about free speech and r liberal values and stuff like that. But they weren't really shoving police. I don't really remember them, you know, throwing stuff at the police. I, I mean, maybe if someone can correct me on that, I I'd, I'd appreciate that. Um, but as far as all the videos I've seen, I don't really remember that. It was, um, it was just students shouting slogans. Um, I mean, there was a lot of them. So it wasn't like it was an unthreatening situation for, for the powers that be, but it did seem like it was the the government that was first to initiate force. But in this case, you know, it was the protesters that were initiating force. I mean, I, I know it's it's going to sound a bit, it, it sounds weird, right? Because they were the ones forced into their homes, um, you know, by force. But um, yeah, I've never, I've never really seen so many people push to the point they were, where they were willing to potentially lose everything in order just to be able to get their their voice out there so you have to understand for every person that is yelling about um 
you know, freedom and stuff like that, or down with Xi Jinping or down with the government, those people are really risking their lives. There's actually a very good chance that those people will go to jail. And although you might see videos of hundreds or maybe even in some cases thousands of people in, in, in the frame of one video all chanting the same thing, um, you don't feel like those people are safe within a crowd, which often usually is the case when it comes to protests or, or acts of unrest. You know, if you're within that crowd, you can kind of disappear into it and, you know, maybe you throw a rock at a police head, at a cop's head, uh, but once you disappear into the crowd, it's over. But in China, it's different. Um, for one, there's too much surveillance technology um, through the phones and uh, just through the, uh, the cameras that are around. They've got so many cameras everywhere. It's very hard to, to get away with anything. And the tolerance is extremely low as well. So if you said even... Again, if you were just holding a blank piece of paper, that's now a punishable offense. They don't really have the rule of law in China. It's what's called the rule by law. So pretty much they can just make up a law and then they can they can basically do use it however they, they deem fit. Um, and there's already plenty of laws against what they're doing. Um, they, they don't have to create anything. I mean, it's pretty much, I mean, just, they can just say, oh, it's civil disobedience. You go on, boom, like that. So it, it's, it's, very, it's very sad to see the protests. Like, I know a lot of people are cheering it um cheering for them and saying yeah you you go you know you you can do it but it's i mean i really feel for them because it's like i i believe they have every right to be extremely upset about what's going on and i believe they're all in in incredible danger with um with this whole chingling this this zero covid policy um i believe everyone's extra extraordinary risk from their own government but i feel more bad for them than i am optimistic because i mean Pretty much, the, like, the, here's the way I see it. Like, I think there, there was some study that showed that if, if in order for a mass movement to be successful, you got to have, um, I think it, it, it seemed like a relatively small amount. I think it was like 5, 10%. Someone can uh, correct me on this. But it wasn't a huge amount of people that were required. Pretty much you needed to have 5% of the people out on the streets at one time, and that was enough to, to end the government. There was a study on, like, every protest, um, you know, particularly the ones during the you know, it's during Soviet times, and yeah, it took like 5% of people to create a mass, mass change, and although there's a lot of people on the streets, I don't, I don't know if we're at that critical mass yet, you know, 5% in China is a lot of people, like, let's do the maths on that, 5% of a billion is what, 50 million people, right, and there's 1.4 billion, so you're gonna have to have a lot of people, and there's a lot of people out in the streets, but that's just by numbers alone, but by percentage-wise, it's still probably not enough to to push things and then on top of that where where do you go after that i'm not i'm not being intentionally pessimistic i'm not i'm not shilling for the ccp or being a demoralized intentionally being demoralizing i'm just being realistic like if you do get tons of people that are upset with the government what happens after that i think best case scenario is there's um a backpedaling by the government and things kind of return to uh um a more familiar, more comfortable status quo, perhaps in 2019. I think that's unlikely, but that's the best case scenario. But if, if people are serious about, you know, the ending of the CCP, for instance, I mean, that's, that's, it's a very tall order because then we have to think about what's, what, what are we going to re replace it with? And um, I've had a, I had a very interesting conversation with a friend. So my only other friend who's like really deep into the Chinese stuff like I am, other Australian friend, um, we're talking about like, what is the actual likelihood that the CCP is going to end? Because we're kind of joking about how every video you see on YouTube when you type in China is like China is going to, oh no, China is going to collapse in um, 10 days, China is going to collapse in 8 days, then 5 days, then tomorrow, and then yesterday, one second, right? China is going to collapse. And I'm sure there's, there's aspects about that that could be true. Like, for instance, the economy can collapse, right? But a lot of the angle that a lot of people are coming from is that the CCP is going to be the thing that collapses. But I think that's a bit a little unreasonable um, for a number of reasons. And le let's go through them, right? And I'll give you some counterpoints because I'm not, again, I'm not trying to be intentionally demoralizing. But let's let's look at it clearly for a moment. Um, the CCP uh, survives um, things that were just almost unsurvivable. So the, my recent video, the reason why I've been on a, a, a long hiatus is because I've spent 
past three months, and I'm probably going to spend another three months working on this documentary. It's about the Cultural Revolution. Um, spent a lot of time researching it, and it's actually incredible that the, the Communist Party survived at all. Um, what the Cultural Revolution was, I mean, there's many different angles you could look at it and title it, but I think one of the one way you could look at it is that it's a, it was a civil war uh, between Mao and his loyalists and the Communist Party itself, and it's been well understood that that civil war greatly discredited the Communist Party. And in some sense, there's a split between Mao Zedong and his loyalists, which basically still go on to the say. His cult is still fairly strong in China. It's a large minority of people that still see Mao as a god and the Communist Party itself. Um, so they were basically the, the Communist Party was just ripped to shreds in the 60s and 70s. And it was kind of pieced back together and they kind of just let bygones be bygones about that whole time. But it's not as much of a, it's not as much of like this intense force du jour as it was during Mao's time. And I understand there's cycles and waves in, in any political movement where it goes through a, a strong time and it really has the population <clears throat> under grips, um, whether by force or, or voluntarily. So they've they don't have the same kind of power that they had before um, in terms of s cultural support from the people. But at the same time, it's really something to be said about the fact that it's survived so much for so long. So the fact that it was able to survive um, the 60s and 70s, and also it survived um, the Great Leap Forward as well. It survived the anti-riders campaigns. It survived... Um, the Tiananmen Square Massacre, which is a huge deal, by the way. I just want to go into that for a moment. Um, it's kind of a weird thing to think that, in some sense, the Tiananmen Square Massacre saved the Communist Party from total collapse because it was around that time where you had all these revolutions going on in Eastern Europe against the Soviet Union, and a lot of people with a lot of people and the uh, leaders in China were very concerned. This this anti-communist contagion would. Uh, infect China as well and soon people will be calling for democracy and that almost did happen and the uh, Tiananmen Square massacre nipped that in the bud unfortunately and um, so they were able to survive that huge popular surprise and the question is would they survive now well pri let's let's just for the current moment let's ignore the whole um, the current protests that are against Qingling, uh, the zero COVID policy, and let's let's just focus on two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when all these videos were coming out saying that China was going to collapse. A lot of them were relating to the economics of China and the current geopolitical situation, with you know all these countries kind of turning against China, and um, you know the fact that the economy is is in a mess. Um, if China could have survived all those things that I mentioned before, for sure it could easily. Uh, whether an economic depression um, and bankruptcy even and defaults surely you could also um, weather the storm of um, geopolitical turmoil even if every country turns against China it's already survived a period uh, it was already a hermit kingdom you know for the, for most of its history it's really just until 18, um, 1979 that China actually emerged so I think it spent so let's do the maths here. From 1949 to 1979, it was essentially a hermit kingdom. It was just cut off from the world. There was actually even a a, uh, a blockade on its coastal border. So it was it was totally a hermit nation for um, for uh, 30 years, um, and then from 1979 till today. Okay, so to be honest, it's it's been more open than it's being closed, but it survived that time as being a hermit nation despite being so closed off from the rest of the world. Um, so the question is now considering uh, these huge protests would it survive to be honest like if you're going to go for a punch you got to go all the way and I just I worry that this um, this protest it's just not enough because it's kind of it's a reactionary frush it's it's a reactionary venting of frustration as opposed to a, an organized movement and I mean, I'm not expecting anything more than, than that. I mean, I don't think anyone is really wanting to... Um, anyone with a family in China, I don't really think there's many people seriously trying to 
organize these decentralized grassroots spot fires that are popping up throughout the country, trying to organize them into a, a, into a major force that will eventually come to replace um, the Communist Party. I just don't really see that happening. And now as a result, I just I don't really see it. I don't see the Communist Party going anywhere anytime soon. And even, let's just say, suddenly there were just um, the, uh, the, the, the top brass was eliminated. It's pretty clear that um, uh, something would just come and replace it. Because, look, it's, what, 70 million? 70 million uh, party cadres? You're not going to get rid of those guys. Um, you know, so the idea that somehow just democracy would develop. But, I mean, let's, let's look at some of the scenarios anyway. Just to brainstorm. I'm, I'm, I'm in a process of self-discovery along with you. I'm just thinking about some of these ideas. So if you, was, if you would really want to think about, like, what mainland China, we'll do a bit of alternative history, um, what China might come to look like if, uh, I know it came under nationalist control, right? The Kuomintang, right? The, the, the resurgence of the Kuomintang in, in mainland China. How would that happen? Well, first, very unlikely to happen, but um, let, let's, just, let, let's, let's just play around with the idea for a bit. So, the truth is, there was actually a time when it was possible. Um, when the communists took over the mainland, um, there was a great deal of time where the nationalists still had a lot of influence in the mainland. Um, and they had a lot of spies. I, I made a video about this. Um, it, was, it was about Taiwan. I forgot what, was, what the name of it was, but um, it was about how <clears throat> the, um, the nationalists actually were very successful in in their subversive activities and in, in their cloak and dagger activities in the mainland and it was through their triad networks um and they were operating out of hong kong and uh the kinmen islands and they were successfully able to infiltrate uh the communist party through their triad networks and actually though they there was um there was a long being planned to re reattempt to take over the mainland from taiwan as crazy as it sounds today there was a time when Taiwan was actually no joke compared to, to the mainland. I mean, it was the mainland that was just a complete backwards mess. You have to understand, when they, um, although when, when the nationalists were kicked out of mainland China, China was a, a, basket, play, a basket case. You know, they tried to mimic all these Soviet um, policies. You know, they went with the Great Leap Forward, and then after that was the Cultural Revolution. Um, so they were very, very weak, um, and Taiwan was... Um, a Marshall Plan recipient, and on top of that, they had the support of America, who also was, you know, toying with the idea of helping Taiwan um, reclaim, reclaim China. And um, in my video, I, I talk about how uh, they had like, um, like half a million triad operatives in in China. You know, that, 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 um, who was the who was the I forgot the name of the the general, but he was trying to basically convince um, America to ha to support the the reconquista of China, um, and they had not even not just any uh, triad organization it was actually spe specifically um, the 48k triad that had half a million operatives in in mainland China, and they also had all these operatives in Taiwan, in the Kinmen's, and in Hong Kong, and. Um, if there was any time for the nationalists to reconquer China, that was the time. But I think just decades and decades of purges and trying to survive the Cultural Revolution. I mean, it was hard enough just being an ordinary civilian during the Cultural Revolution. But, um, you know, imagine trying to be a, a nationalist triad operative in China during the 60s and 70s. It's very hard. I think, I think that... All of those guys have been uprooted. I just don't really see it. If anything, it's it's the other way around, where these, I believe, these triad organizations have been um, subverted for the other way. In fact, a lot of people believe. Um, uh, I don't know what you think about Guo Wenghui. You know, love him or hate him, I actually agree with him. He says that um, if anything, the KMT is the one that's that's gone red. Um, I think maybe they've been too obsessed with their one China policy and have decided, hey, look. Maybe we can't be the one China, but hey, maybe they can be the one China. I don't know what exactly it is, uh, but supposedly, yeah, the KMT and the nationalists have, have gone a little too soft on China. But <clears throat> in that 
from that perspective, I think it's very hard to see that there's going to be um, a nationalist resurgence in mainland China. So but why, am I, why am I talking about this? Because I'm talking about alternatives to Communist Party rule, and you can't just shoehorn in a totally foreign uh, system into China without it at least um, developing in some petri dish for some time somewhere. And um, that's why I mentioned the nationalists, because they almost kind of like, uh, they kind of like, in some sense, predate the Communist Party, the Communist Party's thing, because they, they go back to Sun Yat-sen, and Sun Yat-sen's a hero for the communists, and the, um, uh, what, what is it, Renin Jui, the, the, na the nationalist movement, um, in some sense spawned and helped create the communist party as well as the, the nationalist party so the, the they're not to the nationalists are not totally incompatible with the values um with, with the political values of 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 current mainland china but it's it's been slipping for quite a while but regardless i don't think there's much of a chance that they could um reassert themselves politically in china i think that's too that's too much and then the only other thing that i can see this other political petri dish that has been brewing is um guo wen gui's um what, what was, he, he has this uh, this new it was called the, i forgot what it's called but actually it's not a small it's not a small thing um i do think it's being partly propped up by cia operatives um but you know i, I mean i'll give i'll give him some um i'll give him some credit you know um let let me let me be real real specific about this for you because i you you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, this is new federal state of China. What what's it called in Chinese again? Let me. I need to know this for me. Okay, I can't find the name for it. But yeah, Guo Wenghui. Uh, I think it was in 2017, 18. He he's he's this billionaire. Um, from real estate, he has a bunch of uh, plazas and hotels in China, and basically the Communist Party backstabbed him um, in like 2016. They they wanted him to uh, sell all of his property and basically give himself over totally to the to the Communist Party, kind of like what they'd done with Jack Ma, and he didn't go along with it. And he was able to slip out, and um, he met up with um, some of the people in the Trump administration, like Steve Bannon, and they. Um, they were able to formulate this idea for this new, this new, new federal state of China, which would basically be the replacement if China was to to go south. Um, and he's been, you know, he's a very rich man. He's very powerful, and he's a lot more powerful since getting in touch with these uh, these um, these operatives. I I'll just call them operatives. You can fill in the blank about, you know, where exactly these things are, because my guess is probably is as good as yours. I think it's CIA. I think there's all kinds of stuff. Um, in Ocean, because he needs a lot of protection. I mean, the fact that this guy has survived, despite being such, I mean, really being mo the most powerful foreign Chinese enemy of the Communist Party, it's, it's a miracle that he survives, because uh, the Chinese are in Interpol, and they've got foreign police stations all over the world. It's very easy to, for them to take someone out, so I believe that he has high-level protection, and um, it's, yeah, it's for that reason I believe he's, he's a very powerful person. Um, so the question is, you know, the Communist Party collapse, will the new federal state of China be able to um, successfully administer um, the mainland? I don't know. I don't think so, and I don't even know if it's always necessarily a good idea. I don't necessarily feel like it's... I don't, I don't trust these glowies. I don't trust these, these operatives, you know, and like the, that are working with him. I know he, he, it's beneficial for him politically. You know, they save his butt. But, you know, I just... I don't know if it's necessarily a good idea for China because I feel like if he did come to power, there's a pretty good chance that a lot of the Chinese interests would just be sold out to national ent to to foreign entities, and then we're just basically going to end up in a situation that China was in a hundred years ago. I mean, I'm not certain about that. I absolutely don't know. And if any of you know more than I do, feel free to school me some on school me on some information that I know about. Leave a comment. I am I am learning just as much as you. Leave a comment. So. Um, th um, I just mentioned these things only because I'm just brainstorming what is it that could even replace the Communist Party because those are the only two functional entities. You've got the nationalists um, 
and you've got Gorwin Gray's uh, glow. I don't want to say the the epithet glowing glow in the dark <laughs> operatives. Um, and that's really it. I don't know what else. I mean, you certainly don't have anything in China. It's a one-party state. Um, so that's just my concern when, you know, everyone's talking about the end of the CCP, but you can't end it without replacing it with something else because it's just good. It's a hydra. you got 70 million Communist Party pa- cadres, and they're just going ha- to come up with a new guy. Um, and the reason why I also mention this is because it's also about the culture as well. If it was w- within the culture... Um, to, to, you know, create different political systems or to even think about different ideas, then we wouldn't even be having this conversation. It would be like, okay, well, if the Communist Party falls, then someone will think of something else. And then people would have a vote, and then it would, it would go to that. But it's not even necessarily within people's minds about what potential alternatives there are. I mean, people might have an idea about democracy, um, and then something would have to be created on the grassroots. Um, but that takes a lot of time. Like This stuff takes a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of management. Um, and it requires a, cu- a cultural backing to it that I just don't really see is there. Yes, you have a lot of people that are calling for democracy right now. I, there is no doubt about that. You have people calling for cr- free speech in China. But it's a country of 1.4 billion. And it is shocking. It's really shocking when someone might go to some bridge somewhere and just plant a, a banner saying, you know, free China, whatever. Or when someone goes on camera and says, free China, you know, we want democracy. That's a shocking thing because of the consequences. And it might get on a lot of news stations, but it's unfortunately still not the reality for like um, the over a billion people in China who don't, who frankly, they just want the the immediate end to the, to the suffering they're facing. I mean, I'm sure there's people that are thinking more long term about the direction their country is going in and, and want to see you know a more long term political solution. But for the average person, they just want to go outside, man. They just want to open their businesses. They just want um, their lives to go back to normal. A lot of them just want food, frankly. I mean, if you're locked inside your your sh- little Shanghai apartment for three months and you you know you get like a couple of cabbages a week and a potato, like, you just want food. A lot of these guys, and then they're just going crazy as well from going, uh, um, you know, from just being inside all the time. So, from from that perspective, I just don't really see this uh, being a, a, a major, a, a, a major repudiation of the, the powers that be. Um, it might be a, a loss of face, for the communists, I think it is in in a, in a great sense. It's definitely a massive loss of face. Um, so I'm not saying that the communists won't suffer any significant pushback. Like it's not like they they're not going to get any loss from this. They they will. They are suffering a huge loss from this. But it's it's not the kind that people are imagining in the West. Um, so yeah. So on on to the next subject. Um, the next thing I want to discuss with you is. So the next um, subject I want to discuss with you is uh, where, where China is going in the future. And I just want to emphasize, like, this is just off the dome, stream of consciousness. I'm, I am in a process of self-discovery talking with you right now. So feel free to write your angry comments about some ideas that you disagree with. That's fine with me. I'm, I'm, I'm not, like, the, none of these things I'm talking about right now is the hill I'm willing to die on. These are just some ideas that I have. And I'm, I'm just, I'm enjoying thinking about these things. If, if it is something I'm willing to, do, if it is a hill I'm willing to die on, I'll tell you about it. I'll, I'm happy to tell you about it. But we're trying to go in in the future, man. Um, well, one thing is, th- I think the, a, a lot of the way China is um, being governed right now is, is about their, it's, it's about, the increase in their um, their hegemonic status, um, but more in contrast to the to the declining powers powers of the rest of the world. So we could talk seriously about the economic decline of China, and it's it's no joke. But I don't think the the com- the party really cares at this stage, especially can, when they're willing to lock up to twenty percent of their workforce. So either the people who make up twenty percent of the GDP of um of the nation they're willing to lock them down um so it kind of makes me feel like they don't really care about economic growth as much as they were before because even if they were able to keep going 
um, I think that the their real estate Ponzi is just it's too hard for them to prop up anyway. So from what I'm seeing, it doesn't really appear that China is still trying to 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 grow economically. They just want to uh, decline at a much slower rate than the rest of the world. And I think they're playing this waiting game where the winner is just basically the last person standing. Not necessarily the winner is a person who has the most stuff, but just who is who is still politically viable 10 years from now. And I mean, your guess is as good as mine about what's going on in the in America. And let's let's I'm, I'm going to keep it trying. I'm going to try and keep it very germane to China right now. But you can fill in the blank about with what's going on in the West and um, there. But what we can certainly agree on and what I'm absolutely happy to 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 be to be the statement that I'm willing to die on is is the fact that, yes, the West is in total suicide mode. Like, they are committing suicide at a tremendous rate. And I think China is seeing this and like, well, look, we're, we're not in a good situation either. Like, our birth rates are just uh, just crap. We're probably going to have half as many people 50 years from now. Our economy is going to crap. We've given all these loans um, to all these countries across the world, and they, they keep defaulting, and the world's turning against us. It's, it's all a mess for China. But... For them, it's probably, at least for them, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm wargaming from their perspective, it's probably less of a mess than the way they see the rest of the world going in 10 years from now, right? So, uh, Russia is still, in fact, a, a peer competitor of China, and Russia is quickly going the way of the dinosaur. And then, European Union, I mean, honestly, you could have a far better argument that the European Union is going to collapse within 10 years than the Communist Party, right? And let's also make it clear, the goal of the Communist Party is to preserve the Communist Party. Not, it is nothing, they, their goals have really not as much to do with China in general, right? The economy of China or whatever. They just want to maintain their political viability into the future. And as far as I'm concerned, the EU is far more unstable as a force than the Communist Party. And then we've got, we, then the question is more on what's going to go on with America. And that's still, that's still up in the air. But it is a very, very volatile situation in America. And pretty much it only requires um, Western he hegemony to continue to, to decline precipitously in order for China to win. And I think that's the angle that they're going for. They're not, they're not going for um, uh, the... Uh, uh, they can't win everything. And I think, they, I think at some stage they've just accepted that. And the other, th the other big thing I, I want to talk about is the, um, the central bank digital currency. Because... It's not just the West, but also China that's going to go through this great reset thing. And um, f the, 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 the issuing of the central bank digital currency will be the side of the great reset. Because when they, when they do that, in, so, in some sense, they're rug pulling the current currencies that we have. Once they decide that this is going to be the way to spend your money and no other way, that's going to be it. Like There is no going back from that. All your current, I mean, they'll, they'll give you um, a grace period, but essentially what it's going to look like is you're going to have to get all your, you're going to have to take all your money to the bank and your bank is going to be forced um, to transfer that money into the um, CBDC variety. Um, so in China, they call that uh, the Shu Zi Renminbi is uh, the EU on. So... You're basically. I mean, I think if, if most people keep their money on WeChat and RM, and Alipay, I think it, they'll just they'll just go straight into people's WeChat and Alipay accounts and just flick a switch, and then instead of seeing the the yuan symbol, it'll be like Shuzi Yu Shuzi Yuan. You know, the, it will just basically the name will just change, and the fun but the function will essentially be identical, but with a few added features, and we'll, we'll get into that in a bit, right? But that's that's basically the future of the CBDC. It's going to just rug pull and. Um, at some, at eventually, at some stage, those who have cash, um, the, the cash will basically be worth it. So if you, if you plan on surviving the apocalypse by storing the cash under your mattress, and then you want to go spend it in the future, at some stage, that money is going to be worthless. So they're going to rug pull it, and that's going to be the great reset. And China is much further ahead than this than most other countries. And um, I've spent a lot of time translating articles um, for your benefit. Um, regarding the um the situation with the with the china's digital currency so they've already gone through a number of test phase pilot phases in different cities um they did it like a big 
airdrop, I guess you could call it, where they just gave a ton of free um, digital R&B to a bunch of people, and they went out and spent it, and they, they got a bunch of businesses to start accepting it. Um, and they're really ramping it up. And the reason why I mention this is because all these countries, including the Western countries, need to need to do this great reset thing where they basically rug pull the fiat currency and replace it with the CBDC because they're insolvent and their debt is basically catching up to them to the point where they can't pay for it. Um, but they want to maintain their uh, grip on power despite the fact that they're totally insolvent. So basically, they're just going to say, okay, this currency is useless now. Let's bring on a new currency and we'll just basically restart the cycle. We'll restart the... Um, the Ponzi scheme. That's exactly what it is. But except with this Ponzi scheme, it's going to be far more. It's far more efficient at maintaining um, the Ponziness of it, right? So when you um, when a current when a current, when a government creates debt, and again, if you're an economist, you know more about it. Feel free to school me. I, I have zero ego. Feel free to school me. I don't care. But from what I understand, in order for a government to, to make printing machine go burr. They don't just press a button, you know, they have to sell treasuries to the, to the Federal Reserve or the central bank, and the f central bank will send currency back. But basically what it is, they've, um, they basically just have given an IOU to the Fed, and the Fed, who has nothing, they just have a printing machine, will then give that money to the Fed. And, and they do all these other things. They have like, it's, it's maybe too much to talk about in one video or in, even in a few sentences like I'm trying to do now. But they've got so many different levers in order to be able to micromanage this system of, of debt and balances. And it's actually kind of complicated um, for them. And there's, there's, there's limitations on what they can and can't do. And um, I think we could all agree that the goal of the, the central banks is essentially just to, to accrue as much money and power for themselves at the expense of everyone else. And for those that say that's some kind of conspiracy theory, it's like, look, if, you, if you're working at the Fed, it's pretty clear that you're stealing money from the average person. Like every time you print money, you're stealing money from the people who are saving it, right? And um, that's exactly what their goal is. So with the with the the digital rmb and the other cbdc's for instance what they have into it are things called smart contracts so when you do when you're looking at ethereum um, or these other layer one protocols on, on um in the cryptocurrency ecosystem um you have the ability to program money so i can technically um create a program that when i send you say ten dollars worth of ethereum um, you need to spend that Ethereum within like 30 seconds, like within like 30 seconds. Like if you don't send, if you don't send that Ethereum to, to someone else within 30 seconds, you lose that Ethereum. Like it, it will just come straight back to me, right? Um, so they can do stuff like this. And the, but the, the thing is, the difference between say Ethereum and the CBDCs is obviously the most obvious case in point is the fact that... Um, it's cryptocurrency. It's anonymous, and on top of that, um, most importantly, it's decentralized. So I can't program your money if that if that's your money. I mean, I won't be able to program my money, and then you can agree whether you want to um, to deal with with, with me. Um, you can sign a contract. We will sign a, a contract online, um, and that's a voluntary thing. But with the CBDCs, you don't get a choice. The government is going to program whatever the heck they want into these currencies. And you'll have no choice but to accept it. In fact, the, the, again, the difference is, let, let, let's just say Ethereum is totally corrupt. Um, I, I don't have to buy Ethereum. I can buy Bitcoin. I can buy whatever. I don't. No one is forcing me, putting a gun to my head and saying, you have to buy Ethereum or you can't buy anything. But that's it's different with the CBDCs. You're going to eventually have no choice but to use these CBDCs or you're not going to be able to do anything or you're going to lose all your money. And... When you're so you're forced into to using these CBDCs, and then they're going to put smart contract conditions on them about how you can spend them, what you can do with them, and they'll know exactly what you spend your money on. And they've got all these very efficient ways of um, of adding capital controls. So it's going to be harder to take your money out of the system. It's going to eventually become it's going to become harder and harder to pull your money out of the country. It'll be harder and harder to change your money into other currencies. And a lot of governments. Um, I think a, lot, a big reason as well um, they want to do this is because they want to. It's it's they want they basically want to institute capital controls. Um, if you're if you're like um, if you're in China and you're you're 
your biggest if, if, sorry if, if you're a party apparatchik you one of your biggest concerns is um capital flight because everyone wants to take their money out of china because you can only invest it in a bloody real estate ponzi scheme um so if you're rich and you're powerful what you'll do is you'll go in a junket with other rich people in china to macau and um you'll have one of the state approved trial triad organizations um wash your money and then you can get it into us dollars or whatever you, whatever the heck you want usually it goes ends up in southeast asia or australia um uh but that's there if you're allowed to, they'll they'll allow you to do that if you're part of the club but if you're just an ordinary person if you just made a business and you're rich and you don't then you're sick of um your your money being controlled so much um you know it, it really sucks but people will find ways and there's all kinds of ways people all kinds of ways you know people would go over to hong kong and they'll just buy a bunch of gold watches right that's one way of cap of doing capital flight but there's all kinds of stuff right um and the big thing is of course is with bitcoin you know um even though they banned bitcoin you know a million times uh, the 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 crypt the, the crypto community is still really big. I mean, China's still I would argue still the biggest crypto market in on all the world, and all the biggest exchanges, or at least the most the most important exchanges, um, have come out of China. Um, and I know that I know they're all in Dubai and and the Caribbean now. But you know, for for a stage, I mean, think about Binance, Huobi, uh, Bitstamp, like all these big exchanges came out of China. So, um, uh, the part of this is because of the desire for capital flight and the the technology is continually making it harder for a country to be able to keep the citizens from pulling their money out of the country look I'll, i'll tell you straight up when i was in china what i used to do was when i was um when i was working is that i hated doing money transfers out of the country because i didn't know if my my boss was super dodgy and he didn't want to pay tax and so I'm going to get in trouble so I didn't like going to the bank and transferring a bunch of money back to Australia so what I used to do is I used to go to a P2P crypto exchange and I would just buy bitcoin with my RMB using WeChat or Alipay and um I would get my money out that way and then when I would go back to Australia I'd just sell my bitcoin for um you know for for whatever right and more and more people are like, um more and more like there's all these countries with volatile currencies who are like man I don't care if I potentially lose value because of the volatility of bitcoin I just want to get my money out in any way I can right so if you're in Venezuela or you're in El Salvador your your fiat currency is already volatile enough already I mean I don't even think El Salvador even has a national currency anymore they have to use the US dollar that's how crap their currency is right but there's all these currency there's all these countries where they're like man I, i don't care if bitcoin goes up and down by like 70 80 percent of swing i just get me out of my national currency at least it can't be taken from me at least i can just use it as a medium medium of exchange and you know maybe i've only got it for a day and i just during that day i use it to to get into usdc and that's actually a big target for that's sorry that's that's the ultimate end des- destination for um, these crypto transfers like if someone a lot of people like they might just want to get their money from RMB into Bitcoin so they can put it into USDC and at least it's safe that way and a lot of them prefer it that way so the digital RMB and the CBDCs are meant to totally mitigate the possibility of ever being able to have control over your money ever again forever it is the mark of the beast system it is the the one ring to rule them all like what tell me what what can you what do you think you can do like when you've when all of your money is being converted into this like what what's what is your i know what the end game is but what's your end game if you i've never met a single person that supports these cbdc's because most people don't understand it but even if they did what what do you think they're imagining their future would be like what 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 can you do with it or you know with with your money after that you know um you there's still going to be inflation but it's going to manifest in different different forms that they, they will get inflation under wraps but again it's not because they've actually solved the underlying issue of inflation aka just printing money out of thin air and just creating tons and tons of debt to enrich themselves um they haven't solved those problems at all it's just they're going to find all these different like microeconomic levers to make it seem like the the inflation's not that bad but they're going to do all these other things um but it, sorry it's going to manifest in all these other negative ways there's this there's, there's no there's no positive things about it so I'm very much focused on how these 
CBDC things are going to change the fate of China and eventually the world. So I'm really paying attention to what's going on. And it's, I think, well, look, there are these huge protests going on in China right now because of the uh, Qingling. But the question is, why is there even Qingling? Why is there even this zero COVID policy in the first place, which is basically destroying the economy? It's absolutely a self-inflicted wound at this stage. No one is doing this to China. No country is making China lock itself down and destroy their economy and, uh, and their credibility even um, as, as, a, as an international player. Why, why would they do this? And a lot of people have, can only hypothesize why this is happening. And what I personally believe is going on is that China, um, well, I won't say China, but I'll say the, the upper party apparatchiks see that there's kind of a, a massive break with history that's happening. And the times that were before are now no longer, and we are moving into a vastly different future. And of those things include war, um, huge economic catastrophe and a, uh, a great reset. Um, and I think the only way that they can get away with their plans for maintaining the viability of their political system is whilst this really tragic, dramatic shift happens, this great reset is unfolding, um, they basically need to lock everyone up inside so they don't go completely ape shit, which they will. Um, so if we just look at the CBDCs, for instance, if they suddenly come out and say, look, you've now all your money or not, they won't say you now have to, they will just do it and then they'll announce it. They'll just say, okay, everyone, all your yuan is now worthless. It's now Schutzer RMB. It's now the digital RMB. Um, then again, they're not going to ask for permission. They will ask for permission. They will ask people to take their cash to the bank. Um, so... When they do this, they're, they're, people will absolutely go freaking mental, and they should. And um, especially these older people who deal in cash, like you've, I'm sure you, I, know, I understand, like you've got these Zoomers and Millennials that are, like they've, oh, sorry, Zoomers, they've grown into the, the, the whole cashless society already with the WeChat and Alipay stuff. But, um, you know, you've got all these old people and people, people who just still rely on cash, and there are a lot of people of course are just naturally going to be very suspicious about what the 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 party is up to and um when they get their opportunity to go to the bank they might even protest and many banks will i mean banks are going to go bust one after another when when they do this i mean i as far as i can tell and i'm sure there's a lot of inside information that i'm missing out on maybe there's things i don't know but as far as i can tell this is going to completely destroy um, all but a few chosen um, Chinese banks. Um, obviously, the PBOC is you know, the, the, the Chinese, the, the People's Bank of China will survive, and the, I think that's their central bank. But for the most part, most banks are just going to get completely wiped out, and that that goes along with everyone's savings. And um, pe Frank, yeah. People's ability to even transfer their money from the Chinese yuan into the Schweizer RMB. So this is going to be like a very painful rebirthing process for the Chinese financial system, and who knows where this could lead. All, all I think the the party apparatchiks know is that um, the people are going to be very angry about that. And I think that's why they're prematurely locking them down. Um, I could be wrong about this because maybe they maybe they won't roll this out for another year. Um, uh, but it, it does seem sooner than we expect. I mean, probably 2023 is when they're going to do it. I mean, that's all the numbers that I'm reading is is pointing to 2023 being the date when it becomes official. I mean, it's already kind of semi-official, but it's again still in that pilot phase. But um, they're going for it. They're going for it, man. And um, when they do, it's. I think the the party is going to feel very grateful that they 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 were locking people down because they just don't want people to to go nuts. They want people to suffer in silence and and not voice the opposition to it. But um, on on one final point, I'm I'm kind of, my thoughts are getting a bit dry. I've been speaking for a bit too long. But on one final note, I'm very focused on this because of I believe that. This is coming to a place near you. Every country in the world is doing CBDCs. Out, even out here in the Caribbean where I live, they're doing these CBDC things. And um, I'm sure every country will have varying levels of success. 
Um, not every country can go full on totalitarian mode like China, and people are just going to vomit it out instantaneously. Um, but they are going to try, and they are going to at least try to rug pull the current fiat system. Because um, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, I think they think, I think that they think that it's inevitable that um, the the currency is basically going to become worthless at some stage, and they need to transition to something. So. Even if you think this whole great um, reset stuff is just a conspiracy theory, you can't deny that they will at least try. They will at least try to do it. They're going, the CBDC things are the great reset. They, they're one in. They're one in. Um, they're, they're both the same in in many respects. So everyone should be paying attention to this. Everyone should be paying attention to what's going on in China. They should be paying attention to what's going on with the CBDC situation. And um, yeah, that's all I've got for you today. I hope it's been insightful. Please subscribe and I will see you later. Peace.